the Honourable Member for Edmonton Strathcona. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Speaker. <clears throat> Madam Speaker, this budget is disappointing both for what it provides and does not provide. Counted among our critical duties as elected members is holding the government accountable for its spending. As per Standing Order 80, the House retains the sole authority to authorize supply. In 2002, the Standing Committee on Government Operations and Estimates was established with the clear mandate to guide and oversee the House of Commons estimates review process either directly or through the estimates documents or indirectly by examining government operations. As critic for par public works at the time, I participated in a review to strengthen parliamentary scrutiny of estimates and supply. We examined both the format and timing of estimates and program priorities and the need for greater support to members of this place in effective scrutiny of spending. As the report states, and in quotes, Parliament's control of the public purse is still very much at the heart of our democratic government, end of quotes. Madam Speaker, among the challenges facing members is the lack of access to information, expertise, and the time to fully understand and review estimates and operations. We need access to clear, consistent, and reliable information and analysis. Many experts support appointment of an independent PBO, or Parliamentary Budget Officer, mandated to assist members and the committees in their evaluations of spending. So what actions have been taken by this government to deliver on their promises of more open and accountable governance and the creation of an independent PBO? Well, despite election promises, they tabled a 300-plus page omnibus budget implementation bill, amending no less than 30 bills. And despite promises to the contrary, this omnibus bill strikes a blow to the ability of the members of this place to deliver our responsibilities. Bill 44 significantly reduces the independence of the PBO and in turn the ability of that office to serve the needs of members. Why is the PBO so important? The office was established specifically to provide independent analysis to this place and the other place. In quotes, about the state of the nation's finances, the estimates of the government, and trends in the national economy, and to estimate the financial cost of any proposal of a matter under federal jurisdiction. Madam Speaker, analyses and reports of the PBO have proven invaluable in disclosing issues in costing and spending. During the election, the Liberals espoused clear support for an independent PBO. In quotes, Madam Speaker, we will not interfere with the work of government watchdogs. We will ensure that all of the officers are properly funded and accountable only to Parliament, not the government of the day. We will ensure that the PBO is truly independent, properly funded, and answerable only and directly to Parliament. End of quotes. Madam Speaker, while in opposition, the Liberals echoed our calls to the Harper government to act immediately to make the PBO an independent officer reporting directly to Parliament. Well, now in power, what have they done to the PBO? Are they making the Parliamentary Budget Officer an independent officer reporting to Parliament? No. They're mandating the speakers of the two houses to scrutinize both the priorities and spending by the PBO they are further reducing its independence. Another broken election promise, a serious blow to the mandate of the PBO and to the ability of the members in this place to carry out our responsibilities to hold the government in account. And an important reminder, Madam Speaker, to all members of this place, including on the government side, holding the government accountable for spending is not just the duty of opposition members. It's the duty of all elected MPs. We all benefit from an independent parliamentary budget officer. The government says it's open to amendments. So please, strike down these measures that are reducing the independence of the parliamentary budget officer. So Madam Speaker, what's missing from the budget bill? <clears throat> well, after 18 months in office, not a single bill has been tabled by this government, let alone enacted to protect the environment. If they so favor the return of omnibus budget bills, why not one to restore the laws that Stephen Harper eviscerated and the Liberals promised to restore? There's been no bill to restore the protections to navigable waters, a once critical trigger for environmental assessment. 
there has been no bill tabled to extend to Canadians a voice in policies and approvals impacting their health or environment. A commitment, Madam Speaker, that is imposed on the government under NAFTA. Three, no bill has been tabled to restore a credible environmental assessment process or even interim measures, interim reforms, as the government glibly approves major resource project after resource project. Finally, Madam Speaker, there has been no bill tabled to enact the rights prescribed under the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. This government espouses to support those rights, <clears throat> including the right to free, prior, and informed consent to developments on their territories or impacting their peoples. And yet, again, we see First Nation peoples and Métis having to take this government to court because of their approval of the Site C Dam, because of their approval of pipelines, because of their abject refusal to even review major projects and consider right and title of First Nation peoples. While there are pages of rhetoric in this budget bill on their commitment to clean energy, there is close to zero dollars actually allocated to be spent on those important goals this fiscal year. Now we have raised this continuously, Madam Speaker, that they say, okay, over 10 days, 10 years, over the next decade, blah, blah, blah. We're going to commit all kinds of dollars to child care, to housing, and including to shifting to a cleaner energy economy. And yet, when you actually look at the pages of the budget bill, where they actually allocate the dollars, they allocate absolutely zero for a clean energy future in this year's budget, including no monies to assist Northern and First Nation communities to switch from dirty, polluting diesel fuel to cleaner sources of energy, something they desperately need. Their skill development and innovation budget also makes no commitment for a just transition strategy for workers and communities for a cleaner energy economy. Now this is something to the credit of the Alberta government that they are proceeding with, with the workers of the province, including in the coal-fired uh, power industry and for the oil sands industry. It's something that the Germans are pursuing with their workers. Because if we are switching to different sources of development, it's very important that we also have a skill development an educational strategy, uh, an incentive strategy to support the workers to gain retraining or to relocate to, to switch to a new kind of, of training. Certainly we see private entities in my own province, uh, electrical contractors themselves, through fees that they pay on their contracts, are actually setting, have set up a training program for electrical uh, workers, for electricians, including plug-ins for electrical cars and including for the installation of solar panels. Uh, we see no word in this budget bill, nothing in the budget implementation bill, to actually move forward on a strategy for a genuine just transition towards a cleaner energy economy. So those certainly would be uh, measures that I would love to see added to the budget bill, which the government has said that they are open to amendments. And so I think that those would be very useful amendments to add to lend greater credibility to their talk of balancing environment and economic development. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I look forward to questions. Questions and comments? Uh, questions et commentaires? L'honorable député de Sherbrooke. Honorable member for Sherbrooke. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I'd like to thank my colleague for her speech. And I'd like to go back to something that she mentioned at the beginning of her speech, and that's the twisted logic of the Liberals when it comes to omnibus bills. When we ask them about uh, whether or not this is an omnibus bill, the answer that they give us is that, well, don't worry, we have a solution. We're going to give power to the Speaker to split bills, omnibus bills, into several different bills. But the Liberals are in government. They could have done exactly that. They don't need the Speaker to uh, split this bill. They don't need the Speaker to... Uh, create different bills. The Liberals wrote this bill. So if they don't want omnibus bills, why did they uh, uh, why didn't they refuse to do an omnibus bill? They wrote this bill. So I'd like to hear my colleagues' comments on the uh, twisted logic of the Liberals who say uh, that uh, we shouldn't have omnibus bills, but this is an omnibus bill. Uh, the Honourable uh, Member for Edmonton Strathcona. And the Speaker, I'd like to thank uh, my colleague for his excellent question. And indeed, it's an obvious question. Only today, during question period, the government said, oh well, uh, we're going to uh, let the speaker decide if they could divide up omnibus bills. 
to decide which committees they go to. And yet, as I mentioned in my speech, they promised during the election there would never be another omnibus bill. They almost also committed that they would create an independent office of the parliamentary budget officer, which gives us greater ability to actually hold the government accountable on spending. Now, when they were in opposition, they also supported, uh, they spoke against the omnibus bills of the Conservative government, and they certainly spoke for creating an independent parliamentary budget officer. So we see a certain level of hypocrisy here, Madam Speaker. Questions and comments? Questions et commentaires? The Honourable Member for Sherbrooke. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I'm happy to be able to ask another question because I'd like to hear my colleagues' comments on the Infrastructure Bank, which is uh, in uh, this bill. It's an important part of this bill. And when we talk about uh, splitting the bill into several parts, well, this is something we could take out of this bill so that parliamentarians could uh, specifically vote on this measure. That and uh, they might uh, vote differently on this measure than other members. And that's uh, the point of splitting the bill. It allows uh, parliamentarians to vote uh, on different aspects of the bill without uh, voting for the whole thing together. So when it comes to the infrastructure uh, bank proposal, I'd like to hear what my uh, colleague thinks about the dangers that this could uh, have uh, when it comes to, for example, privatizing our infrastructure, particularly given that uh, in the bill, uh, the mission or the mandate of the infrastructure bank would be to... Uh, I create projects that would uh, generate revenue. So uh, uh, what kind of project is that? Well, that's an infrastructure project with uh, user fees, for example. I'd like to hear my uh, colleagues' uh, thoughts on this part of the bill, the creation of uh, an infrastructure bank. I remember for Edmonton and Strathcona. Madam Speaker, another excellent question from my colleague from Quebec. Madam Speaker, I too am deeply concerned about the establishment of the infrastructure bank. I'm sure I shared with many in the House today are shock when the government suggested that a mere 15 billion dollars for establishment of the infrastructure bank using taxpayer dollars is nothing to worry about. Well perhaps that's small change to the Liberals but it's not small change to the majority of people I represent. There are also growing concerns among the public about the conflict of interest in the very people who were con consulted on the establishment of this bank who may in fact be the very persons who get contracts or get loans from this infrastructure bank to uh, initiate major projects. I heard earlier from uh, some of our Liberal colleagues about how committed she is and the need for affordable housing. We need uh, more spaces, affordable childcare. Well, I don't think that anybody is going to be going to the infrastructure bank to establish those projects. I've met with uh, the majority of the groups in my own city who are trying to provide affordable housing and housing for the homeless, and uh, we're in dire straits in our city. And it really would be nice if, in fact, the government take part of that $15 billion and put it towards affordable housing and access to affordable childcare. 